There's a joke that if you go to a country and you don't see a Nigerian run away from that country, it means it's not safe. <laughs> Nigeria, one of the fastest growing nations on earth, remains central to the future of Africa and all that means to the rest of the world. Today, we hear from Lai Muhammad, the nation's long-serving information and culture minister, a former chief of staff to Nigerian President Tinubu, and the newest partner in Ballard Partners. He talks about how Nigeria's fate will help determine so many others. From Ballard Studios, it's 13th and Park. The future doesn't belong to the faint party. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. We will make America strong again. We will get through this together. I can hear you. Honorable Minister Mohammed, it's great to welcome you to the show. Welcome to 13th and Park. Boward Partners just announced that you will be opening our firm's first office on the continent of Africa in Nigeria's capital city. And we are so thrilled to have you be a part of our firm. And thanks for being a guest today on 13th and Park. I'm very honored and excited to be part of uh, Boward Partners family. Thank you for having me here today. We're, we're very excited. We want to talk about some issues of interest to our audience. Why is Nigeria so important to the future of Africa? The future of Nigeria is important for the entire continent, not just because um, we have a population of over 200 million people or have an economy which is the biggest on the continent, but more importantly, like uh, President Barack Obama said, if Nigeria does not get it right, it will be difficult for the whole of Africa to get it right. And I can't agree more with him. Because when you look at the population of Nigeria, some states in Nigeria, like Lagos State, the population, the economy, is bigger than most of West African countries. Mm -hmm. And that is why it is important that we get it right. If we do not get it right, it won't only affect the economy of Africa. It also affects the stability and the peace of Africa. And I give an example. We just uh, concluded a general elections, you know, 2023. Now, many people don't understand that the number of registered voters in Nigeria alone surpasses with 13 million the total number of registered voters in the entire sub-region. Mm -hmm. Now, this is our 25th year of peaceful democratic transition. And that is important. If we get it right politically, there will be more stability on the continent. And so for reasons of economy, for reasons of you know, stability, for reasons of geopolitical you know, stability is important that Nigeria gets its right. And what are the keys to getting it right? Peaceful, democratic transition. I think it is the bedrock of economic stability, it's the bedrock of, you know, of uh, security, and it's the bedrock of you know, peaceful coexistence among neighbors. And I think we got it right. You see, the issue of uh, unnessing the resources of the country, very important, but... The most important thing, really, is getting the country to be at peace with itself. And one of the most important things is to have credible elections and let every Nigerian understand that democracy is about rule of law. Mm -hmm. Adam, this is fascinating. But to think about you saying that the country to be at peace with itself, I know a lot of people mm -hmm. would say the same thing is important for the United States of America. But Adam, turn it over to you. Well, the, the question that's on the minds of a lot of Americans right now, Your Excellency, is we'll call it the competition. No secret that China, and Russia, and others made a lot of moves to be involved, not just in Nigeria, but across the continent. How important is it that the United States of America start to weigh in more 
to cement or re-cement the relationships that we've had in the past and to be more involved knowing that if they fail to do that, others will take that place. For a very long time, America used to be one of the biggest partners of Nigeria and of Africa. And of course, we share many affinities. Regrettably, like Riley said, I think America took its eye off the ball for a while and allowed you know, other countries to show interest in Nigeria. But when you look at America and Nigeria, I think it's the mutual interest of both countries that we should cement that partnership because this is probably the future of the world. For those who don't know, what are some of the major exports? What are the products that Nigeria exports to other countries? Well, I I think people look at Nigeria and think about, you know, crude oil. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Nigeria is more of a gas country than an oil country. In other words, you know, we have more reserves of, you know, gas than we have of uh, petroleum. Now, but uh, Nigeria is also a huge agricultural country, and we do export cocoa, we do export coffee, we export uh, uh, grains, we export, uh, you know, fruits. I think the biggest surprise in my, you know, for me about Nigeria, which is often not um, emphasized, is the creative industry. Mm-hmm. And Nigeria is home to music, is home to films, is home to fashion, is home to beauty, you know, during COVID-19, we undertook a survey and we were surprised to find out that even though Nigerian musicians ruled the, you know, ruled the waves, we are known for our Nollywood, but that actually industries like, um, you know, fashion, like um, hospitality, like uh, beauty and air care, actually employ more people and actually generate more revenue hmm. than uh, film and then music. Of course, we are very proud of our musicians, many of whom have won the Grammy Award. And our Nollywood, I think, is watching about 50 countries. But then, I think we still need to do more to expose our fashion, our gastronomy, because they employ more people and they generate you know, more revenue for us. What is known is that there are are more than 400,000 Nigerians who are living in the United States of America today. Isn't there kind of a natural connection and bond that the people of both nations have? Yes, you are right. There's an affinity between the two countries. Uh, But you see, uh, you must understand one thing, that Nigerians actually like immigrating. Nigerians like moving, you know, and going out of of their own um, habitat. It's more of a a joke that if you go to a country... I don't see a Nigerian run away from that country. It means it's not safe. (laughs) Now, but that's probably on a lighter note. Now, if you look at Nigeria and, you know, the U.S., Nigeria has a lot of very qualified and competent, you know, nationals who have settled and are working in the U.S. and contributing to the economy of the U.S. But one thing you can't take away also from the U.S. is that it's very accommodating. U.S. is welcoming of, you know, many cultures and many people. In the case of Nigeria, I'm glad to say that uh, we have, you know, huge colonies in Houston, we have in uh, Detroit, we have in um, other parts of, you know, uh, the U.S. The cultural affinity is also amazing because I know that both in um, Detroit and I think also in, uh, I don't know, Delaware, every year there are, you know, weeks where the, we, we celebrate African culture. Uh, But generally, I think it's easier for Nigerians to settle and work in the U.S. than anywhere in the world except probably the U.K. Tell me what the Minister of Information and Culture does. I mean, you served for eight years in that position. It sounds like a lot of fun and a lot of travel, but also very important to the image of the country. Tell us a little bit more about that. It's for the promotion of um, understanding between the government and the governed, on the one hand, and the management of the reputation and image of the government, and at the same time, promotion of the culture and the traditional values, and overall, making it accessible for not just Nigerians, but for the entire global 
world to have access to timely and credible information about the country at all times. In Nigeria, the media industry is very expansive, it's very complex, and it's broken into many groups. We have the Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria, we have the National Union of Journalists, we have the Nigerian Guild of Editors, we have the National Association of Women Journalists, and I felt it was important for me to engage each and every one of them so that I can explain to them the programs and policies of government. Your Excellency, there's something, of course, that's been come to be known as the Lagos model. This is where the current President Tinubu was governor for many years and successfully. And it basically, it, as I understand it, it's a way to make local government do more in providing services, infrastructure, and the others. I'm going to play a clip. Love to get your comment on it. Lagos is widely believed to be the model for good governance, infrastructure renewal, and innovation. A 21st century economy is centered on four cardinal pillars of thriving economy, human-centric city, modern infrastructure, and effective governance. It serves as a blueprint of how African megacities should actually be built. It's interesting. To serve as a blueprint, couldn't the Lagos model be a blueprint not only for the rest of Nigeria, but for the African continent? Thank you, Adam. I'm glad that I was part of that um journey in 1999 when I served as chief of staff to the president of Nigeria when he was governor of Lagos State. So I am not completely strange to what happened in this period. Right. But one thing I think even the president has admitted is that the Lagos model might not work for every other state. However, the principles are the same, which mm -hmm. is having a government where it is people-centered, having a government where you're going to provide infrastructure, you're going to provide social you know, intervention, you're going to lighten the burden of the citizens. And he said in, I think it's his interview with uh, The Economist, that the beauty of Nigeria is that each state has its own unique selling point his own unique advantage, which he is going to leverage on. And there is going to look at how there can be synergy between states. Mm -hmm. For instance, you look at a state like Lagos State with all the energy and everything. It lacks, you know, the land. You must look and at the peculiar and unique advantage of each state and use it to develop. Nigeria's national soccer team they were ranked fifth in the world by FIFA 20 years ago. Will they make a return to the World Cup in 2026? You know, football in Nigeria, it's, um, it's a passion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a joke about myself. <laughs> I went to Cannes in 2017 as a minister to attend the Cannes Film Festival. At its customary the embassy made arrangements for the staff to ease and facilitate my travel arrangements. So the embassy official that was sent to Cannes met a brick wall with the airline official who insisted that he must see me before he checks in my luggage. <laughs> and the embassy officer said, no, this is Mr. Lai Mohammed. It's one of our most important, you know, minister. And the man said, look, this is about safety. So when I got to the airport and the guy, he told me, I said, no, 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 the airline official is correct. It's about safety. So I went and presented myself to the airline official. He took one look at me. He said, so you are the important man <laughs> from Nigeria? I was expecting you to see J.D. Okocha. <laughs> you see, your culture played, you know, professional football in France for many years. So to the average Frenchman, J.D. culture was an important person. That we missed qualification in 2022, I think, is a national grief. But I'm very confident that we will not miss it in 2026 for three reasons. Number one, if you look at our track record, we qualified for World Cup in 1994. We qualified in 1998 qualified in 2002. 
We only missed 2006. We qualified in 2010, we qualified in 2014, we qualified in 2018. It was only 2006 and 2022 that we missed. So you can see, apart from Cameroon, I think with Cameroon, we have the greatest football credentials in Africa. Now, and you can see things are moving. Last year, Morocco played at the semi-final of the World Cup. So you can see things are actually moving towards, um, uh, you know, um, Africa. But more importantly is that the FIFA, they have changed their format. The 2026 World Cup will be a 48-nation format as opposed to the 36 format of before. And nine slots now will go to Africa. And I, can't, I don't see how Nigeria will not get one of those nine slots. <laughs> well, Your Excellency, I want you to suit up now. Your nation needs you on the pitch. Uh, <laughs> no, we, and of course, 2026, the World Cup is in, in the United in States, States of America, yes. as well as Mexico and Canada. But actually, another reason why I'm so confident that we are going to be, be qualify is that the new football federation, they've now changed their focus to pick people from the local, you know, leagues in Nigeria, the likes of um, Kanu, the likes of Okocha, they mm. have no extra loyalty to any other person than Nigeria. And I think that's going to change, you know, the, the game. Well, Your Excellency, thanks for joining us, for being a part, the newest part of the Ballard family. We're so thrilled because we know with everything you've done on behalf of your nation, you've done so much more as a, a symbol of hope with a message that people really want to follow, not just throughout the African continent, but across the world. Thank you, Adam, for those very flattering words and the support and encouragement. I look forward to being within the family. I thank you very much. Well, Adam, it's another great episode. What a fantastic guest. I think it's our first former, former official of a government that we've had, a uh, non-U.S. government that we've had on our show. Mm -hmm. And what a fascinating topic, really. I mean, it's not something that gets a lot of headlines normally, not usually on the front page of the papers, maybe when there's an election or some, some violence. But what I took away, at least from the beginning of the conversation, we covered so much ground, was why the future of Nigeria is important to the future of the entire African continent. I knew exactly. that Nigeria was the most populous country, I believe, in Africa. But when I heard the number 200 million, I have to admit, I did not realize 200 million was the population of Nigeria. So I asked him about the importance of that. He said that uh, he quoted from former President Barack Obama that it's important that Nigeria get it right. And when I pressed him on that, he said that for Nigeria to get it right, it needs to have peaceful transitions of power and it needs to be at peace with itself. So again, I found that kind of interesting because I know that that's one of the challenges that we right. have in the U.S. is being at peace with ourselves because a lot of times things <laughs> are feeling very, very polarized. So I thought it was a really interesting way to start off our conversation. There are over 200 million people right now, and they're getting younger, by the way. By the year 2050, it's going to be decidedly young. And on the population demographics, as you look at nations across the earth, they're going to be either in the best position to make a real advance into this next century or... They're not, depending on whether or not their economy is well, people have jobs, something that certainly the new president, Tanubu, who's very experienced, by the way, longtime governor of the state of Lagos, which is the biggest state there. But their GDP is, I think they rank like something like 25th in the world. So this is a major league player uh, and certainly within the continent, a major league factor in how that continent's going to roll over the next couple of decades. Yeah. And uh, again, it's not something that's on the front page of our papers, but it's, it's a large continent. And more importantly, I think in terms of geopolitics, mm -hmm. you raise the issue of the competition between the United States and China and yeah. the Chinese efforts to make inroads and develop uh, relationships in that continent. And I think we heard Minister Lai say that it's important for the U.S. to stay engaged. It's important for the U.S. to to show how important that continent is to the future stability of the world. Well, we heard that many episodes ago from Ambassador Pham. We heard that in terms of entertainment from Eric Swartzel from Los Angeles and the Wall Street Journal. If we're going to kind of plant a flag again, 
in the African continent in terms of interest, and you had to pick a place where you would start in that new effort, you go to Nigeria. It's got so much that's happening there and such incredible impact. And I think, frankly, Justin, if we were to do that, I think it makes it easier for us to re-cement relationships across the continent. Yeah, look, it makes political sense, too, because of the large number of Nigerians that live in the United States who are contributing to the U.S. economy. I also found it interesting, Adam, you know, being a former communications director for Governor Jeb Bush (laughs) to hear about what it's like to be the minister of information and culture for a government as large as Nigeria was. And to hear about lots of the things that he was doing to be proactive on communications uh, in terms of town halls and all the things that he was doing with the different media organizations there in Nigeria. They have a very robust media, uh, news media there. So I found that part of our conversation fascinating as well. I smiled when he said town halls, and I think you were too, because here in America, town halls have become lightning rods, right, of protests. But he lit up when we started talking, frankly, about soccer. You know, the universal language of sport begins and ends for much of the world with soccer. And, you know, you asked the question about, you know, you you had that one little blip where you didn't make it to the World Cup in 22. In 26, of course, the World Cup is in the Americas. And we need to have Nigeria back. I mean, they have a hell of a tradition. As you pointed out, they were one of the top clubs in the world like 20 years ago. And I guarantee you, if you're going anywhere in that nation, soccer isn't far from the conversation on any dinner table in that country. No, and I'll be watching that with interest to see uh, what happens with their national team for the World Cup in 2026. And I think he made a really good argument as to why he's very confident (laughs) that they're going to be back in the World Cup. But uh, what a wonderful, interesting conversation. Absolutely. Looking forward to the next one. See you next time. Don't miss future episodes by following us on Apple, Spotify, or other podcast platforms, or go to the YouTube channel where you can subscribe for free.